Hi again. Uh, so I'm back to talk to you about uh, uh, Nigger Heaven by Carl Van Vechten and we're about to explore the color factor in the novel. Uh, so to what extent is the novel a colorblind novel? Now, uh, Joseph Conrad um, has been accused by Achebe, uh, by uh, Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian novelist, of um, foregrounding color unnecessarily. Um, he makes fun of, of Conrad uh, for drawing attention to the color of characters uh, in uh, Heart of Darkness. Now, um, Carl van Vechten doesn't try to avoid uh, the topic of color. Um, now, you could argue that this is a bit voyeuristic, um, that there is no need for it. Um, I would counter that Van Vechten includes description of African Americans and various colors uh, as, as a foreshadowing of the 1960s slogan, uh, Black is Beautiful. Um, so even though this phrase black is beautiful only appeared in the 1960s, uh, it was very present uh, in the way African Americans and pe writers like uh, Van Vechten um, were doing in the, in the 1920s. Um, so uh, just to give you a few examples of that, um, he draws attention to the, to the beauty of, uh, of skin color. Um, all right, so here's an example. Two or three of them lay recumbent on the sand, their brown limbs gleaming like bronze in the sun. Um, he was, she noted, slightly lighter in color than the others, almost the shade of coffee diluted with rich cream, her preferred tint. All right, so that's Mary looking at Byron at the start of their relationship. And he, he also, uh, we later learn in his part of the novel, uh, likes her golden brown tint. He's drawn to women who have that particular color. Um, right, so, so there's nothing demeaning there about that, on the contrary. Right? It, it is drawing attention to skin color, but in a very positive, aestheticizing way. Um, right, you, you could argue that it is drawing attention that you know, this is part of of what feminist critics call the male gaze, but there is also the the female gaze um, foregrounded in this first part. Um, so, th so there is nothing disempowering about uh, about these descriptions of of skin color. Um, Another example here is again the rich golden brown color of her skin was well set off by the simple frock of Pompeian red crepe, which she wore. Right, so a lot of attention to, to fashion as well in this novel. It was the 1920s. Coco Chanel had just invented uh, her, her you know, um, very uh, long dress with, without curves that tended to be figure-hugging at the same time. Um, so, you know, it was a great time of, it was a great visual spectacle. Right? The 1920s were all about being seen. Um, right, so uh, just one last one there on that. Here, uh, page 189. Um, there were, to be sure, a few white faces, faces of men and women who had come from the upper reaches of the island, but most of the skins were black or brown or mulatto. We should be known as the rainbow race, Byron assured himself. Right, so the, the rainbow race uh, um, anticipates Nelson Mandela's notion of the uh, Rainbow Nation uh, in, of South Africa, right, which includes all all ethnic groups. Um, right, so so the rainbow race here is something that suggests diversity within the community. Uh, that Harlem is in itself, um, although it's African American, it's still very diverse um, and and full of full of color and 
and complexity and beauty. Um, so I, I, you, you can object to the word race, um, especially in a, in a French perspective where the word isn't used anymore. Um, but in, uh, in America, um, it's still used uh, by African Americans as well, who, uh, who feel proud uh, of their race. Uh, you know, there's a certain lot of racial pride. Um, so the word ethnic community is, is preferred in France, but not necessarily in America, where uh, the, the word race isn't, is just neutral. Um, uh, it's not used negatively um, for the most part. Um, right, so uh, that's skin color um, and skin tone. Now I'm going to explore um, to what extent uh, the novel is an essentialist novel. Now uh, there's a passage here on page 54. Um, now by essentialism I mean um, a tendency to suggest that a particular um, type of person, a, a, a particular group, has uh, an essence, a fixed essence. Um, so the stereotype uh, for African Americans would have been that they were um, more sensual, more sexual, uh, more bodily. Right? That was the stereotype. So that saying that kind of thing would be an essentialist uh, statement. Um, so we're going to, since it's written by a white man, we're going to see to what extent uh, the perspective offered in, in the novel is, is essentialist. Um, so, now uh, it's, it's a passage where uh, Mary is wondering why she's so different to her, her friends um, who, who embrace sensuality. Um, at any rate, whatever the cause, Mary realized that she was different in this respect from most of the girls she knew. The Negro blood was there, warm and passionately earnest. All her preferences and prejudices were on the side of the race into which she had been born. She was as capable, she was convinced, of amorous emotion as any of her friends. But the fact remained that she was more selective. Oh, the others were respectable enough. They did not involve themselves too deeply. On the other hand, they did not flee from a kiss in the dark. A casual kiss in the dark was a repellent idea to Mary. What she wanted was a kiss in the light with the right man. And the right man hitherto had never appeared. Right, so here we see um, the, the notion of, of Negro blood um, is, well, by modern standards, a little pro uh, problematic. Um, in the 1920s, that was commonplace, um, right? The, the, the very word blood uh, was, was used a lot uh, by racists and non-racists alike. It was just uh, a cliche that was used. Um, now, so here we have a character who is herself uh, of mixed race, or she has light skin, um, light brown skin, and she, uh, she herself has these thoughts. Right? So you could say that Mary herself, or rather that uh, Carl van Vechten has made Mary uh, a bit of an essentialist, in that she, she d describes her, her tendency to, to not express emotion as um, just a holding back of, of her, her Negro inheritance. Um, so, so a definite tendency there to, uh, to essentialize um, African Americans uh, and well Africans as more sensual, more emotional. Um, so now another passage here um, is page eighty nine. Um, now, uh, this time she's at uh, listening to um, jazz. Uh, 
Now it says she she had seen Hester fall under the sway of Negro music that evening at her home. On many other occasions she had observed this phenomenon. How many times she had watched her friends listening listlessly or with forced affection, uh, at, affected attention to alien music, which said little to the Negro soul by Schubert or Schumann. Immediately af thereafter, losing themselves in a burst of jazz or the glory of an evangelical spiritual, recognizing no doubt in some dim biological way the beat of the African rhythm. Savages, savages at heart, and she had lost or forfeited her birthright, this primitive birthright which was so valuable and important an asset. A birthright that all the civilized races were struggling to get back to. This fact explained the art of Picasso and Stravinsky. To be sure, she too felt this African beat. It completely aroused her emotionally, but she was conscious of feeling it. This love of drums, of exciting rhythms, this naive delight in glowing color, the color that exists only in cloudless tropical climes, this warm sexual emotion, all these were hers, only through a mental understanding. Right, so you, you can understand from reading that passage why uh, quite a few African Americans in Harlem um, felt that this was um, rather demeaning. Um, because even though Carl Van Vechten was clearly uh, in favor of helping African Americans, uh, he he did he did have these essentialist views. Right? They were aired in his articles, um, which he published with the New York Times um, at the time. Uh, he also used to work for uh, a newspaper in Chicago, and um, so here you have this notion that. Uh, that classical music, for example, it does not express um, or, or, you know, does not awaken emotion or, or any feeling in African Americans, right? So that's, that's very, very, you know, it, it's very binary in, in the way it's set up, right? Uh, as two different mutually exclusive kinds of music. Um, and this notion of the Negro soul as if as if it was any different, um, right? So I, th I think Vecton was, was probably divided um, on, on the issue, uh, as, the, as the novel uh, shows. Uh, there's clearly um, a tendency to give differing views of this, this essentialist notion. Um, so I'll give you an example uh, of something that contradicts uh, this rather romantic racism, if you want to call it that way, or modernist racism, where you have this glorifying of everything that's um, African or oceanic, uh, right? This tendency was called primitivism in the arts, right? Picasso was a primitivist, right? They, a lot of these artists, like Modigliani as well, turned to African art because they felt that uh, that Western civilization had lost contact. Uh, D. H. Lawrence was uh, in favor of this view as well. He also felt that the the West that Western um, art and Western society was losing uh, its connection to the emotions. Right. So a lot of these artists felt that the a way to reconnect. Western civilization to deeper feeling um, was by uh, engaging with African art of the past. Um, right. So it's also problematic when he says uh, he he says the civilized nations. Is it uh, right? So there's something there. There's a strong opposition there. A strong binary antithesis. Um, which is, you know, deeply problematic. Um, I don't think he Van Vechten excludes African American uh, culture from the notion, the realm of civilization. He clearly doesn't, um, in any way. But here, uh, yes, the the word is the civilized races, right? That's deeply problematic. Um, 
And it's even more problematic, you could say, uh, since it's um, an African-American character who is thinking these thoughts. Um, so she, she seems to have uh, kind of internalized uh, these binary oppositions. Now, uh, so if you, if you read that kind of passage and, and left the book there without reading the rest of it, you might think uh, that uh, uh, Van Vechten went, went quite wrong in his assessment of what was going on. Uh, in Harlem, uh, but you, there are other passages like this one here, um, page 122, um, where Mary is talking to Byron and they're discussing the notion uh, of race and um, he says, uh, you know, she says, why, why don't you write about us, she demanded. Us? Yes, Negroes. And he says, why, we're not very different from anyone else except in color. I don't see any difference. I suppose we aren't, Mary spoke thoughtfully. So, um, so here we have um, well, Byron, who clearly um, has a, a more determined view of, of equality, he he's, seems more of an egalitarian um, um, than, than Mary is to some extent, even though she agrees with him here, ultimately. Um, so, um, now, Byron could be said to share um, the view that uh, George Schuyler had. Now George Schuyler was, was a, a, a novelist uh, famous for having written Black No More, um, a great um, African-American novel that's actually a science fiction novel uh, published in 1931, um, which also caused a sensation. You could say that uh, this novel and, and Schuyler's Black No More are the two most famous novels, uh, excluding um, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, which was written after Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance ended, you could say. Um, so they were the two most famous and sensational novels. Now, George Schuyler, he, he argued that um, the Afro-American, this is a quote, the Afro, the Afro-American uh, was is merely a lamp blacked Anglo-Saxon, right? So rather provocative um, that the only difference uh, really between uh, an Anglo-Saxon, since our America is based on Anglo-Saxon culture for the most part, uh, the only difference is um, just um, tanning, right? So the skin color. Um, and now he was he was quite isolated in that view, um, not because he wasn't, not because he was the only person who was um, who had a kind of de desegregated, deracialized mind, but because a lot of the African American elite in Harlem uh, wanted to be um, seen as defining. Um, an essence, a different um, kind of art. They wanted to be seen as distinctive and different and not, um, not part of, of white America. Um, so that they really wanted to promote a different aesthetic. Uh, so, so in a way they were slightly separatist whereas Schuyler uh, would have none of that. Um, so Byron adopts that kind of view, at least at the start of the novel. Um, now, uh, so, the, so essentialism there is, is subverted, right? So this, the essentialism that's uh, presented in the novel uh, is, is also uh, subverted in the novel. Right, so this is more like what uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian 
uh, critic, uh, the structuralist critic, argued, um, right, was that novels and wor works of literature, especially plays and, and novels, were um, polyphonic in that they expressed several views. They didn't express one fixed view. Um, so here we, you, you, they articulate different kinds of perceptions. Um, so we clearly have uh, that going on here. Uh, another example is on page 210, um, where uh, you have another kind of undermining of, of essentialism. Uh, when a, a white uh, American visiting uh, Harlem uh, is made fun of um, by, by the narrator. Um, so this, this char I'll just read you the passage and then uh, comment on it. So uh, th this character says, I think you are wonderful people, he announced. A perfectly wonderful people. Such verve and vivacity, such dancing, such singing. And I've always thought colored people were lazy. I suppose, he added reflectively, that it's because you're all so happy. That's it, Rusk, he cried. They're all so happy. Right, so um, now this might not appear ironic read, uh, read separately, but in the context it definitely is because we've just seen uh, the difficulties that Byron has been going through in getting published, in getting a job, uh, in, in just making ends meet in Harlem, which is supposed to be uh, the heavenly city for African Americans, and it's really, really tough. Uh, later on in the novel he'll go as far as to say that uh, Harlem is hell, uh, right? contradicting the, the title of the novel entirely, making it uh, profoundly ironic. Uh, so th the fact that this character is saying that, that African Americans are just all so happy, uh, s you know, strikes um, a poignant chord when you think about all that the character has been through. Um, so, so here we have um, uh, Van Vechten making fun of, of white Americans and their very cliched views of, of what Harlem is all about, uh, the very reductive views of, of what it is to, to, to live in Harlem. Um, And, and, and to be a, what it is to be an African American. Um, so, so, it, so it's unfair ultimately uh, to damn the novel uh, uh, for being a fraud. Um, it, it certainly isn't a, a simplistic novel. Um, so um, now, uh, just uh, to end on, on, a, on a point about exploitation. Um, now, some, some of uh, Van Vechten's friends um, and others that he had uh, portrayed in the novel uh, felt rather bitter about it. Um, and they felt that, uh, that he was being exploitative, um, right? And in recent... Uh, Recent uh, the, the recent flowering of, of um, political correctness as well, um, uh, and the notion of entitlement, cultural entitlement, uh, has brought this to the fore. Um, now, some some culture critics argue that you are no longer allowed to uh, to use the culture of others to to explore it. Um, that that is a form of theft, and that you are not entitled if, uh, to a certain cultural experience if you do not belong to that cultural experience. Um, you know, people like John Steinbeck had, had no problems about that. I mean, he, he used to uh, ask laborers to tell, them, tell him stories, um, and he would just write these stories down um, as his, well, as his own in a sense. Um, he used to pay them a few dollars, um, so he wasn't heartless. But you know that that kind of cultural theft went on. Uh, that was it, it's only recently in, in since the year, the years, well the first years of the 
1980s and then again at, at the start of the 21st century that um, the notion of, of cultural entitlement um, has reappeared. So you could say that the novel is exploitative in that it does cash in on uh, African-American experience um, but I, I would ultimately argue that uh, the novel does provide um, an accurate picture of Harlem. Um, it, it did gain um, Van Vechten some, some notoriety um, and he was able to sell his novel more widely thanks to, to its topic. Um, but that ultimately his um, he, he he did labor over this novel a lot and it did it was dear to his heart and he did want to promote the uh, the values of his friends and their achievements he mentions Langston Hughes he used Langston Hughes's poetry in the novel um, so it really does foreground um, African-American um, worthiness, uh, the, the worthiness of uh, Harlemite culture. Um, so I'll, I'll end with that um, and just a passage uh, where Van Vechten has his character uh, uh, talking to Mary and this other um, man, Gareth, and um, they, they, um, it's suggested that um, African Americans need to start writing more about their own experience, uh, or white American writers will, will just seize on it. Uh, so Van Vechten does, does include his own guilt uh, about about writing about something that he is not really a part of uh, although you know he went there so often that you could say that it was his life as well living in Harlem was his life um, so here it is do you know he went on wistfully I think I'd like to write a Negro novel Mary laughed everybody seems to be doing that have we become so interesting Someday, Dr. Lancaster was saying, perhaps a Negro will write a novel about white people. I'd like to see that done, Gareth said. It has been done, said Mary. I suppose you mean Dumas? Alexandre Dumas, suggested Dr. Lancaster. Or Pushkin, Alexander Pushkin, Gareth offered. No, I mean by an American Negro, Charles W. Chestnut. He's written several novels from a white point of view. Right, so Mary is a librarian and she's very learned. She knows uh, all about literature. Um, and uh, so Van Vechten here is um, pointing out that uh, 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 there have been African-American writers who have written about very, success, very successfully about African-American experience. Uh, and that um, this needs to be done uh, more by uh, African Americans uh, on every level. So, okay. <laughs> See you. Thank you very much. Bye.